Well, hello, FCF. We're continuing our journey. We're calling uh, Core Critical Truths. We've covered a lot of ground, and I don't want to take too much time, but I want to just slightly backtrack. We, we started with the idea that all of what we call Bible truth or Bible doctrine or theology, it, it's nothing more than looking at the person of God and what he's revealed about himself and then attempting to organize and systematize it. But all theology, all truth, all doctrine starts with the personality of God. And there's two components about God that we always have to kind of keep in mind. The one that he is absolutely the Almighty. He can do whatever he wants to do, but he's equally all loving. He is governed by sacrificial, unselfish love. Therefore, he doesn't do whatever he wants to do. So the two balances of his almighty power, and with that almighty power goes his, he's all-knowing and so forth, um, and his uh, sacrificial love, where you have then the safest, most intelligent, most relatable person in the universe. And so we always, when we're reading the Bible, if we stumble across something that just sounds a bit jolting or shocking, it, and we may wonder, boy, that, that sounds extreme. Um, of course, you check it out with as many other verses as you can and try to get clarity, but you ultimately check things back with the character of God. Does that fit with the fact that he's the Almighty who is also the all-sacrificial, so his almighty power is always governed by his love? Uh, we said that the most generous, gracious, loving thing that God could do, the gift that he could give would be to create beings who had the capacity to experience life like he himself does. And hence he made the, angel, and the angels and ultimately we humans. We are image-bearing beings. We have mind, reason, emotions, will, imagination and so forth, moral reasoning faculties. We, um, we can experience life the way God himself does. And a key component of this gift is that God gave us free will. Because God is a loving being, an authentically relational being, of course, the great gift would be to give this same ability, this same freedom to those that he creates in his own image. So we, we have the freedom to trust God and obey him, to like him and love him, or to distrust him and disobey him and to not like him and not to love him. We have that capacity. The angels have the same capacity. We also spoke about God has something called foreknowledge, and this is important because foreknowledge does not interfere with free will, meaning God foreknows, in other words, before the angelic rebellion ever occurred, before Lucifer ever rebelled against God, he knew it was going to happen, and he had equipped himself, prepared for it, but he didn't cause it. He knew that Adam and Eve would be tempted ultimately by Lucifer and that we too would break trust with God, but he didn't cause it. So foreknowledge is not causative. Um, now, does God foreordain certain things? Yes. The Bible teaches that those that return to God, the human family, those that return to God in trust by putting our trust in Christ, God has foreordained that he would continue to work in us until we are transformed to the very image of Christ. And that just means that we're still going to be our unique self, but a Christ-like version of ourself. So certain parts of God's plan are foreordained, but they don't in any way interfere with free will. All right, we also covered the subject, well, what about those that never hear? And what we've shown by Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that even without a Bible, God has sufficiently revealed himself as long as we're willing to activate these powers that he's given us of observation and reason. And he holds us accountable. And the truth is, is that if we're not using those to seek him, well, then we're, we're living in a way that he says is, is below what we are capable of and below what is right or righteous. Okay, we also tackled uh, the problem of, of evil because sometimes, sometimes people will say, you know, well, if God is almighty and all good, why doesn't he squelch or squash evil? If he's uh, almighty, he could, you know, d extinguish evil. And if he's all good, he would. So maybe he's not almighty and he can't extinguish evil, or maybe he's not all good, so he doesn't want to extinguish all evil. We show that neither of those are true. When God chose to make beings with the capacity to experience life and love the way he himself does, free will was included, and he knew that that free will would be misused, and he already planned the only thing that could finally 
bring the universe back in a reconciled relationship with himself would be that God would continue to reveal himself and finally he would reveal himself sacrificially in Christ, Christ on the cross. And at that point, God has taken away all grounds for humans or angels to ever distrust him. Now we know that he's good through and through, that he always wants what's best, always knows what's best. And so he's removed the grounds for us to distrust him and therefore disobey him. So he allowed evil, but he's only allowing it for a little while. He didn't cause evil, okay? Satan, Lucifer, he exercised his own free will. We exercise our own free will, but he is allowing it. And the genius is that by allowing it, it allowed God to show a sacrificial side of himself that he couldn't have shown in any other way. And it also has allowed him to extinguish it forever in the eternal future by two factors. Number one, now the whole universe knows that God is both almighty and sacrificially good. This builds the, the, the foundation for us to trust him uh, completely and to trust him eternally. He's also, by, by allowing himself to suffer and human beings to suffer and angels to suffer. In other words, as we have practiced evil, as we have had evil practiced against us, as we have lived in a world and in a universe that's immersed in evil, we now know it up close and personal. And we know that anything that God says don't do, it's because he knows what is best and wants what's best. So, so we've been, as it were, immunized to ever being tempted again in the eternal future. So even though we'll, we'll be living in eternity face to face with God again, we'll never ever, no being will ever be tempted to distrust God and disobey God again because we've now experienced the lesson. This is what it brings when God is distrusted. This is what it brings when God is disobeyed. And we've seen the sacrificial purity of God's heart. Okay, so we, we've covered a lot of ground. Now, I want to turn the corner because one, one of my... Um, concerns through, through my lifetime of being a follower of Christ is that that we churches do a reasonably good job of showing people slices of God's truth, but what we have not done historically a good job of is showing people the big picture. I actually did a series of messages some time back called The Big Picture, and I gave this analogy where it would be as though I had a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, and I dumped all the pieces on the table, and then I ask you, put it all together. And so you're just fumbling around. You're trying to find colors that match. It's going to be extremely difficult to do. However, had I let you first look at the cover and you see that, wow, it's a house, a red brick house and a beautiful green meadow and, you know, there's flowers and so forth. If you would have seen the cover, the big picture, then when you went to assemble the puzzle, every piece makes sense. You see the green, you know it's part of the meadow. You see the red, you know it's the bricks of the house and so forth. So... What I've tried to do is to give Christians the big picture because once we know the big picture, in other words, what is God doing? What is his ultimate plan? I mean, he obviously has a plan. What is the ultimate plan? We've looked at pieces of it, but now we want to look at the ultimate plan. When I did that series of messages, I came up with a statement. We actually have it on this little card. don't know if it'll show up or not, but I'll read it. God's big plan is the development of an eternal family of Christ-like beings united in loving devotion to Christ and one another. That is the big picture. And it makes sense. If God is this uh, relational being who is love-governed, well, think of it. He, he expresses himself as the Father. Well, a father wants a family. And in a family, you want uh, authentic, mutual love. You, you want there to be trust, you want there to be affection, you want there to be freedom, you want there to be security, all these things. So once again, I'm, I'm going to read to you God's big plan. If you want to know what everything in the universe is moving toward, what was his big plan when he created something and some things and some ones, meaning angels and humans? God's big plan is the development of an eternal family of Christ-like beings united in loving devotion to Christ and one another. That's the eternal plan. Now, when you know that big picture, and then you go read the Bible, the pieces of the Bible make sense. Um, pieces that might seem detached and incoherent, all of a sudden are not detached, and they're very coherent. 
So we're, we, I want to talk to you uh, in, in some sessions to come tomorrow and maybe the one after that about this eternal plan and, and some of the interesting things that we have laid out in Scripture about that eternal plan of this, this forever family that will live and rule and reign with Christ but are all joyfully submitted to the leadership of Christ for all eternity. All right, we'll close there today. Thank you.